Dr. Sage here, back to talk about microbial genetics. In today's video, we're going to discuss the genetic regulation of protein synthesis. By the end of this video, you should be able to define the term operon and explain one advantage it provides to a bacterial cell. You should be able to differentiate between repressible and inducible operons and provide an example of each. And you should be able to list several antibiotic drugs and their targets within the transcription and translation machinery. Okay, so what is an operon? Well, before I discuss an operon, let's back up. In a previous lecture, we learned about metabolic pathways. As a refresher, recall that a metabolic pathway is where you have, let's say, a chemical A, and you're gonna turn that into a chemical B, and then that chemical B is gonna be turned into chemical C, and that chemical C is gonna be turned into chemical D. Okay, and remember each step in this metabolic pathway is catalyzed by a different specific enzyme. So like enzyme one will help to turn A into B, enzyme two will turn B into C, enzyme three will turn C into D. And that's because you wanna make this product D from originally A, but it takes multiple chemical reactions in order for that to happen, each one catalyzed by a different enzyme. Okay, so that's a metabolic pathway. Now, if you think about this, if you have a metabolic pathway, what you really need is either all those enzymes functioning or none of them functioning. Like it doesn't help to only have enzyme one without enzyme two or three, that would serve no purpose. It doesn't help to have enzyme three without enzyme one and two. So you have to have all three enzymes, one, two, and three at the same time because they're gonna be used together. Well, a bacteria have come up with a way of expressing this where all the proteins from a product of genes that should be working together are expressed together. Okay, these are called operons. So operons are only found in bacteria and archaea. You don't find them in eukaryotes. It's a coordinated set of genes regulated as a single unit. It can be inducible or repressible. We'll define those terms in a few minutes. Category is determined by how transcription is affected by the environment surrounding the cell. Okay, so for example, let's say we need these proteins, proteins A, B, C, and D to either all be expressed at the same time or none of them express, because only one of them alone won't do anything. Well, what a bacteria does is it places the genes for those four proteins right next to each other on its chromosome. So gene A, B, C, D are immediately after each other. And they're all under the control of the same promoter sequence. What this means is that whenever the mRNA is transcribed, you transcribe one mRNA that has the code for all four genes on it at the same time. So whenever this mRNA is translated, you'll translate all four proteins at the same time. It's a really elegant way of expressing multiple proteins simultaneously. So what's gonna happen is RNA polymerase is gonna bind this promoter sequence and then run along this piece of DNA reading it and transcribing from DNA to RNA. Okay, so that's what should happen whenever you want these genes to be expressed. So that's the basic of what an operon is. Now, how do operons actually function? Well, as I mentioned, there's two different types. First, we have inducible operons. These are catabolic operons. Operons encoding enzymes that act in catabolic pathways. The operon is turned on or induced by the substrates for which the structural genes encode. Enzymes needed to metabolize a nutrient are only produced when that nutrient is present in the environment. Okay, so here's an example of that. This is an inducible operon. This is called the LAC operon or lactose operon. So as I mentioned, you have the promoter sequence, which is where RNA polymerase will bind. That's upstream of the genes that should be functioning together. In this case, LAC, Z, Y, and A. But there's this protein called the repressor which binds to the operator sequence. Now, if you notice, this repressor protein, when it's bound to the operator, is in between the genes that should be transcribed and RNA polymerase that's bound to the promoter sequence. What happens is when the repressor is bound here, it physically blocks RNA polymerase. So RNA polymerase binds, but it can't proceed. It can't go through and read the rest of this DNA to transcribe it to mRNA. Now, this repressor, its default state is to be turned on. What that means is the repressor is bound to the operator, blocks RNA polymerase, and it turns these genes off. That's its default state. That's what it naturally does. 
But this is an inducible operon. What that means is when an inducer, in this case lactose, binds to the repressor, the inducer turns off the repressor, causes it to no longer bind to the operator. Since the repressor is no longer bound to the operator, RNA polymerase can now run along with the DNA, reading the DNA and transcribing the DNA into mRNA. In other words, the inducer turns on the operon that by default is turned off. So let's go through it one more time. With an inducible operon like the LAC operon, by default the repressor is turned on, so the genes, the operon is turned off. However, when the inducer is present, in this case lactose, it turns off the repressor, which then turns the operon on, so you can now make the mRNA and the proteins. So that's why it's called inducible, because it's naturally off, but it can be induced, it can be turned on. In this particular one, the LAC operon, this is a really elegant system because what these genes encode is enzymes that will break down lactose. Well, if there's no lactose present, you don't need to be making these enzymes because they'll serve no purpose without their substrate lactose. When lactose is present, it turns off the repressor, which turns on the genes. So the genes then make the proteins, the enzymes, it will break down the lactose. Once the lactose is broken down and gotten rid of, you no longer have lactose, it turns the repressor back on, which then turns the operon back off. So this is a great system. Whenever the nutrient lactose is available, the genes are turned on to break it down. Whenever the nutrient lactose is not available, the genes are turned off because there's nothing to break down. Okay, the other type of operon is the repressible operons. These contain genes coding for anabolic enzymes. Several genes in a series are turned off or repressed by the products synthesized by the enzyme. So the differences between the inducible and repressible operons, repressible operons are usually in the on mode and will only be turned off when the nutrient is no longer required. Excess nutrient serves as a co-repressor to block the action of the operon. Okay, so an example of a repressible operon is the trip operon. Now with the repressible operon, the default state of the repressor is actually to be turned off, so it can't do anything. So this is the exact opposite of the in inducible operon. So naturally the repressor is turned off, so RNA polymerase can bind to the promoter, run along the DNA, transcribe DNA to RNA, and translate RNA to proteins. Now, what these proteins, their job is to do, is to make tryptophan. When the cell has enough tryptophan, it wants to stop making it. Well, it turns out that the tryptophan is the co-repressor for the repressor. When tryptophan is present, tryptophan binds to the repressor, which turns the repressor on, which then blocks RNA polymerase and turns the operon off. Okay, so one more time. The repressible operon, by default the repressor is off, so the operon is turned on. When the co-repressor is present, in this case tryptophan, it binds the repressor and turns the repressor on, which blocks RNA polymerase and turns the operon off. Which again makes sense because if you already have enough tryptophan, you don't want to waste time and energy making something you don't need more of. If you don't have any tryptophan available, then you want to make the enzymes that are responsible for making it so you can make this nutrient that the cell needs. Phase variation is the result of bacteria turning on or off a complement of genes that leads to phenotypic changes. This is heritable, passed down to subsequent generations, and it involves turning on genes mediated by regulatory proteins as described with operons. Now, since we're talking about basically turning transcription and translation on, and in terms of microbiology, in terms of bacteria, it's also important to note there are several drugs that can interfere with transcription and translation. For example, you can have drugs that can actually interfere with the ribosome, such as chlorophenicol, which chlorophenicol binds to the 50S ribosomal subunit, so this portion of the ribosome here, and prevents the ribosome from performing its function. You can also have drugs that bind to the small subunit of the ribosome, such as tetracyclines or aminoglycosides. Well, this was your introduction to the genetic regulation of protein synthesis particularly the operon model that we find in bacteria cells. 
Until next time, this has been Dr. Sage.